Welcome to California Edition. I'm Brad Palmer. And thank you for joining us today. Our guest is Ted Liu. He's a member of the California State Senate. Sir, we thank you for joining us. And I want to speak with you about what we know as GPS monitoring of parolees. But let's back up and explain to our viewers the situation as it relates to sex offenders. What happened under what we know as Jessica's Law? Well, the voters put in through Jessica's Law the requirement that sex offenders be monitored by GPS devices. That's, the, it's that simple. So that's when simple. they get I mean, the judges did other things, but that was one of the elements. So when they get released from prison, they're supposed to put on an ankle bracelet, which monitors where they are. And if the battery goes dead, there's notification. If it's cut off, there's notification. Right. Now we know over the last few years, we have seen a removal of these bracelets, but then we had something called a realignment. Why don't you explain for our viewers what exactly is realignment and how realignment may be impacting the effectiveness of GPS? Sure. And uh, before I go into that, Please. let me just say the voters were very smart uh, to put in the GPS monitoring requirement because a uh, U.S. Department of Justice funded study shows that when sex offenders are not being monitored by GPS, their recidivism rate, that is their uh, rate of committing new crimes, increases three times. So it's, it's an effective tool. It is. So what happened uh, with realignment, which I voted for, I believe it largely has been successful, uh, is that it shifted uh, state prisoners uh, who are non-violent, um, non-sex, non non to county jails, and largely it has worked. However, there was this area of GPS monitoring that a lot of thought was not given to at the time of the vote, and it's an inadvertent uh, consequence of what happened. So as a result, um, it used to be that if you cut off your GPS device and you're a sex offender, you go back to state prison for a year. Pretty hefty penalty. Sure. Uh, with the uh, change in the law, you don't go back to state prison. Uh, it's considered a technical parole violation that will give you at most 180 days in county jail. And, and yeah. that's the key. That is well, the key to this debate. Well, uh, well, let me say people are cutting off their devices before realignment as well. So it's been a recurring problem. It's just that some counties now are not booking these sex offenders uh, because their jails are overcrowded because they view it as a parole violation. And let's talk about a recent investigative report by the Los Angeles Times, which found that since realignment, because these prisoners, these parolees, I should say, are not serving time for cutting off their GPS bracelets, they are cutting them off at greater numbers. That is correct. So uh, since 2011, uh, there has been thousands of parolees who have cut off their GPS devices, over 3,400. And keep in mind, most of these are sex offenders. There's a small group that are hardcore gang members. And as you may know, the LA Times did a recent follow-up story and indicated that the numbers may actually be higher because the numbers you just cited are those where there's actually been an arrest warrant. Right. There are outstanding matters that haven't gotten to the top of the pile. That's correct. The problem, uh, I believe, is worse uh, than uh, it is being reported. And that's why uh, I have introduced Senate Bill 57, which makes it a felony punishable in state prison uh, if uh, you are caught disabling a GPS device. And I want to talk more about this bill that is pending. We know that none other than the Oakland Tribune has come out in favor of your bill not the most right of center paper, so it does say something that you're starting to pick up editorial support behind the bill. Uh, that's correct. And also uh, the record searchlight did a very good editorial and they said, look, um, we're talking about sex offenders here. So and why don't we do this? When we come back, I wanna continue the conversation. For our viewers on HLN, thank you for joining us. For our other viewers, we'll be right back. So, Senator, tell us more about what your bill exactly would do. Proposed bill is at SB? 57. Okay, why don't you tell us about that? Sure. Now, right now, if a sex offender cuts off their GPS tracking device, it's considered a technical parole violation uh, that some counties don't even book because their jails are overcrowded or because they just don't feel like it. Right. What but my it bill will do is it makes it a new felony punishable by up to one or two or three years in state prison. It would be at the discretion of the prosecutor and the judge. And that is supposed to be a hammer to make sure that these sex offenders 
don't just cut off their GPS bracelets with no consequence. Now, let me say this. That feels good. It feels appropriate. It feels right. The problem is that you know the U.S. Supreme Court has ordered California to decrease its prison population. Governor Brown has been very specific that he does not want to do anything to bump up against the target of 137.5% over capacity, which is what the Supreme Court has said. If we start adding penalties that send someone, sends individuals back to state prison, we're going to have an overcrowding problem. That's another 3,400 people. That's why I voted for realignment. Um, but the issue here is we're not talking about shoplifters or burglars. We're talking about sex offenders who have very high recidivism rates. So when they cut off their GPS bracelet, they have a three times increase in committing a new sex crime. That's what the study shows, which means they're going to eventually land back in state prison with a very lengthy prison time plus having new victims. So. I get but, it. Right. I get so it. by creating a new felony, which deters them from doing this, you will actually reduce prison overcrowding because they're going to land right back in state prison. They're not cutting off the GPS devices because they don't want you to know where they're having dinner. So you truly believe that the deterrent effect will be great enough once they learn that they could go back to state prison for a felony that it will actually decrease populations at, both at the, on the state side and on the county side? Well. It's documented past history that when it was a stronger penalty in 2011, uh, they had significantly less people cutting off their devices. And so, yes, if we have a stronger deterrent, absolutely a lot less of them will cut off the GPS tracking devices. I understand your logic. I get it. But Governor Brown has already come out and started questioning this specific bill. I mean, in the LA well, Times. What he questioned was the concept of sending people to prison. And so the argument we're going to be making is, uh, they're going to go back to prison one of two ways, either because they cut off their device and we send that back to prison, or because they cut off their device, run around, do some new sex crimes, and then they're sent back to prison with even lengthier terms. So where do we stand on this bill? You seem to be out front on this. Do you have co-sponsors? Do you have members in the yes. assembly? So the bill is sponsored by the California State Sheriff's Association. Okay. And keep in mind, these are the folks that see this problem every day. They have to deal with it. They understand the huge problem uh, that it's causing. They also supported realignment. And right. so we're talking about a group uh, that, uh, like me, we support realignment. But this issue of GPS monitoring was simply not thought about when realignment happened. And now we're looking at the inadvertent consequences. How would this bill impact county's ability to use GPS for other purposes. As you know, many counties as part of realignment are looking towards GPS to decrease their overcrowded jails. So that's a very good question. So counties also, or some of them, have their own GPS monitoring systems. And again, the entire GPS concept and monitoring system is at risk of failure if- Over these, this issue? Yes, because if the people that are supposed to wear them don't wear them, obviously your system is not going to work. So counties also have to figure out an effective deterrent to make sure these people actually wear the tracking devices. So the counties have separate GPS systems in the state? Some counties some. do. Some don't have any tracking system, but yes, some have their own tracking. Should we be consolidating this? Or is it ineffective to consolidate? Uh, I would Too look many at- Too layers? So I would- Out of your I would, purview? Right. I would look at all, all options to make it more efficient. Uh, right. But in terms of the state, parolees, these are really the most dangerous folks. I mean, you don't just land in state prison because you did something that was sort of bad. You land in state prison because you did something very bad, or you had a history of doing moderately bad things. So these folks who are out of state prison on parole wearing ankle bracelets, they're exactly the kind of dangerous sex offenders that you want to monitor. Have you spoken with the governor's staff? Uh, we have not, but we've been in communications with the California Department of Corrections and uh, getting numbers from them and also okay. working with them on bill language. His name is Ted Liu, member of the California State Senate. My name is Brad Palmer. We'll be right back on California Edition.
Welcome back to California Edition. I'm Brad Palmer. It's our guest, Mimi Walters, member of the California State Senate. Thanks again for joining us. We appreciate it. I want to speak with you about a program that we know as realignment, which is the program whereby uh, individuals that are charged and convicted of lower level offenses will serve their time not in state prison, but county jail. What do you know about the success or failure of the program over the last year and a half that's been in place? Well, one of the concerns that we have is um, the way uh, it's set up is that if somebody has uh, committed a crime, and let's say it's not a violent crime, I understand. Uh, but they have had a violent crime in the past, then they are transferred into the county and they are put on probation instead of on parole. Okay. So a big concern we have is you have inmates now that are being let out on the streets that might have a past criminal history, but we don't really know it because... Literally, what's happening is no one's looking at their priors. They're Correct. just looking at the last crime when considering punishment and or post-release supervision. That's correct. I'm, I'm not taking a position. I'm a neutral journalist. But that does seem surprising, Well, to say the least. Absolutely. Right. We had a piece of legislation, AB uh, 109, right. that passed. The realignment. Mm -hmm. The realignment. And one of the uh, consequences, and sometimes we have consequences that we're not aware of. Unintended. And um, we didn't address looking at past criminal history. We just addressed the last crime. And so now all of a sudden, we're starting to see uh, evidence of people who had a past history of violent crimes being let out um, onto the streets and they're recommitting crimes. And what's interesting is realignment has come into play at the same time that the voters, for better or for worse, reformed three strikes so that your last strike had to be a more serious offense to get the 25 to life penalty. Right. Look, all of this is in the backdrop of the U.S. Supreme Court ordering California to release, I don't want, no, that's not true, to decrease its prison population. Right. So there's a lot of moving parts here. So you have proposed legislation, Senator, that would require the at least consideration of past criminal history when looking at these lower level offenders and their post-release supervision? Yes, because I feel very strongly, especially being a mom of four children, mm -hmm. that I want to make sure our communities are safe. And I don't think we should just look at the last um, crime that they committed uh, because we're doing a disservice to the public. And with realignment and with all the moving parts, our number one job is to make sure our communities are safe. And if we have offenders who are let out on probation and then commit a serious crime, we're doing a disservice right. to the public. What I'm wondering is, as you know, the governor has been very reticent to sign any bills that would increase the prison population. He has his U.S. Supreme Court order hanging over him. Whether you supported Prop 30 or not, one benefit, arguably, is that there is guaranteed funding mm -hmm. for Prop 30 offenders. So would this help? Your bill, is it helped by the passage of Prop 30 because now there's a pot of money? Well, we need to look at, at the monies that the counties uh, are, are being given to the counties. Right. And we need to make sure that that money is getting to the county so that the counties can deal with this issue, too. Right. And that's a big question mark. Is the money going to get to the counties? Right. But under your bill, would these people go back to state prison or county jail? Or we don't know. Under my bill, what would happen is they wouldn't be released into county jail if they had had a prior... I understand. Let's continue this conversation when we come back. For our viewers on HLN, we thank you for joining us. For our other viewers, we'll be right back. Clearly, Senator, lots of moving parts, as yes. you can tell. Yes. There are many different layers to it. Mm -hmm. But let's do discuss the question of increasing prison populations. Okay. Because there is no doubt that if an entire criminal record is considered, there is a likelihood that we will see prison populations increase right. on the state side. That may feel good inside, no doubt. We're both parents. We mm -hmm. want to keep our kids safe. But we still have the Supreme Court order circling right. around us. But we need to build more prisons. I understand we need to build more prisons. Right. So if we want to solve our number, if we want to solve this problem, we need more capacity. 
So let's talk about whether there should be more capacity as we continue right. our interview. Right. Right. Okay. Um, there's been no question that there's been some frustration about how we spend our funding, mm -hmm. education versus prisons. Right. And we know over the years, um, the formulas have gone in one direction, favoring prisons versus education. Mm -hmm. That being said, I think even education advocates and some members on the Democratic side of the aisle have said it may be time that we look at prison construction. Right. Well, 60% of our budget is towards education. Right. You don't have as much of our budget going towards prisons as you do as education. No doubt Prop 98 guaranteed exactly. that. Exactly. So there's not more money being spent on prisons because 60% of our budget goes towards education. But when you compare it to even 1970 or 1980, even despite Prop 98, the figures are, they're getting better arguably right. if you're looking for a more balanced approach. Right. But again, where do we go on the question of prison construction? I mean, there are some counties that are building jails, mm -hmm. but we haven't seen prison construction in California no. in years, right. in years. So where do we go on that issue? Do we need a bond? Do we need just... We need the discussion to say, listen, I don't believe realignment's going to be successful. I think you're going to have more and more um, uh, prisoners let out and more and more, and crime's going to increase. That's what I firmly sure. believe. And when that happens, what do we do? We need to start that discussion about opening up, uh, opening the discussion right. about um, building more prisons. And so do you think... You could do private prisons. People have discussed that. I know. So people, it doesn't have to necessarily be public. But you have special interests that don't want you to have right. private prisons. You know, private prisons is an interesting discussion because mm -hmm. on the one hand, if it's negotiated properly, it can be a money savings for the state. Right. On the other hand, we've heard horror stories right. out of some states back east where these private prisons were run as if we were in a third world country. Right. Um, but are these discussions happening? Because it is something we need to look at. Right. Our prison system is busting at the seams. Right. And even though we do see three strikes reform, which should decrease the populations, we see realignment. But we decreasing the population, does that keep our streets safe? You know, your point's I, extremely well taken. You know, maybe we need sentencing reform. I mean, should someone go to jail for 10 years for possession of cocaine when or crack when they wouldn't get that same sentence if it was, well, we've talked about yeah. behind the orange curtain. Right, so right. Th th there's so many complicated factors here, but let's go back to the underlying okay. issue, which is prisons. I think it's a very, very valid point. Are you hearing discussions about construction? I am not. I'm not really? hearing any discussions. And I, and I think the reason is because we have realignment. Realignment's still new. Right. We haven't seen the full effects of what's happening with realignment. Give it another 12 to 18 months to 24 months, and I think you're going to see an increase in crime. And then I think maybe that discussion will start to happen. So, but then what is the answer if realignment is deemed a failure, or for argument's sake, right. we still have that Supreme Court order? How do we... We have to decrease well, our prison population. Well, we have to de we have to decrease because we only have thirty three prisons. Right. So it's so we have to follow the Supreme Court order. Right. But then, if it's a failure, then what's our alternative? Build more prisons. Right. So that's the question. When does that discussion start, and where does it start? Does it have to start with the Democrats in the legislature because they have a supermajority? But look, I mean, you no, you, we can bring it up, but will anybody listen? Well, but that's but that begs the question. Right, I mean, right. I'm sure there are Democrats right. that are interested in this conversation. I mean, prisons do bring jobs. Well, they, construction. If you have an increase in crime, and people are getting seriously innocent victims are getting seriously hurt, it doesn't matter who you represent that discussion's going to start. And start sooner rather mm -hmm. than later? Mm -hmm. We'll have to see. Yep. Her name is Mimi Walter. She's a member of the California State Senate. When we come back, we will be speaking with Kacho Ashajian. He is a member of the California State Assembly. He is proposing legislation that would change the definition of rape by impersonation. I'm Brad Palmer. We'll be right back on California Edition.
Welcome back to California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. We're now joined by Kacho Ashajian. He is a member of the California State Assembly. And so I want to speak with you about an archaic law that in so many ways has surprised so many different people. Let's step back and talk about a law that dealt with rape and impersonation when a rape occurs. This, this is a very, very old law. It goes back to when, when similar to if you were to put a hand, a horse driven carriages on today's freeway, it just doesn't it's that fit. Old. It's that old. So in 2011, when it came to my attention about a case that occurred in Santa Barbara, and the rapist got away with it simply because the young lady was not married. And, and that's the key. Under the law on the books today, right. when there's rape by impersonation, the victim needs to be married. That's what the law says. It just, it's that simple. It's, I thought it's a no-brainer. We need to revisit this law and protect the, the rights of the woman any and, which way we can. And the impersonator has to be pretending that he is the husband. Right. And so you had a, a proposed bill in 2011 to change that. Actually, that was my very first bill. And it died. It died. It, it did do very well on the assembly floor and through assembly committee. It received unanimous support from all concerns. When we got to the Senate side, it died at the Senate Public Safety Committee for the reasons they said anytime you have a new law or revisiting an old law that will add more people to the, our prison system, then we need to put it aside and look at it. The background being, of course, that was in the midst of the realignment fervor because right. the U.S. Supreme Court had just ruled that California's prisons were overpopulated and were requiring California, still are requiring California, to decrease its prison population. That is true. And, but we went back to work with this with the chairwoman of the Public Safety Committee, who was very nice, understanding what our call was and how we need to get... And is that on the assembly side or on, on the, the Senate side? On the assembly side, we had absolutely right. no problems. But something happened recently with a Los Angeles appellate court. That is true. Similar case happened in Los Angeles that irritated the heck out of everybody, which is not fair that it would get attention when it happens in LA and not in Santa Barbara. A, a woman is a woman. Yeah. A rape oh, is a rape. Obviously. obviously. And, and there should not have been any new reason for us to get all excited and present something that was presented ahead of time. My goals were as soon as Prop 36, which had to do with three strike. Right. When that failed, meaning no more three stock applies, we said, well, here's a way to bring a balance to the population of the prison when third strikers, known as not necessarily will go to prison, but our committed crime criminal will. We got ready to go back first thing this year, and as we were going through the process, LA right. story hit the press and then and, the momentum built up. And what happened there was a Los Angeles Court of Appeal ruled right. that if the impersonator pretends to be a boyfriend, not the husband, that is not considered a rape. It's that simple and, and under that, California law. And that understanding rapes a woman for the second time, mm -hmm. in, in my view. Literally. Very much so. So when that decision came down, Kacho Ashajian got a lot of heat, a lot of press. It was in the LA Times. It was really almost national news. And so you have now built a coalition to change California law in such a way that will change the definition of rape by impersonation. Tell us about the coalition. The coalition is stronger than ever before, nonpartisan or bipartisan, bipartisan. any which way you want to look at it, that finally somebody got the message to say, the rules are rules, the laws are laws, because what did the Senate uh, Public Safety Committee did follow their policy and not the rules. What I want to do when we come back, sir, is talk more about the specific bill and continue our conversation about rape by impersonation. For our viewers on HLN, thank you for joining us. For our other viewers, we'll be right back. Now, sir, you not only got the chairwoman of the Women's Caucus, Bonnie Lowenthal, to be a co-sponsor of your bill, you got the Speaker of the State Assembly, John Perez. That is when, when I'm able to use the speaker's name on any given bill, it, it's a plus. Nothing can shake it any more than that, having him to come on board and say, I, I will support and this. And especially since he's a Democrat, you're a Republican, and Correct. so it really shows that bipartisan nature. I got to tell you, no one else is watching. How'd you do that? <laughs> I mean, that's remarkable. How are you able to get him to when, sign up? When you're working with people who believe in common sense, right. It's very easy. Mm -hmm. And when we're dealing with, with the rights of a woman, 
And when we say woman, we shouldn't get away by just saying it. a woman could be our sister, mother, nieces, cousins, uh, wives, daughters. Right. Uh, it, it's it's as close to you as as you and I are sitting here, or or even closer. Here's a challenge, though. Governor Brown has said on the record several times that he is very concerned about adding prisoners to the state prison system. We know that we're coming up against a deadline imposed by federal courts to decrease our prison population to 137.5% over capacity. Okay. We may not hit that number. The governor's trying very hard. He doesn't want to be in violation of court order. And as much as your bill may make sense in terms of just common sense thinking, he's been clear. You know, like the Senate committee said last year, they don't want to add to the prison population. But he's doing something about it as well with AB 109 realignment. Right. And with Prop 30 passing, even though everybody thinks it's education only, but if you read right. it correctly, it also goes to public safety. So there is money as much as, much as his own commitment to deal with that. And our rapist, lucky for us that we don't have one every day. Of course. So that the numbers of that possibly can increase the the population of our prison is not there. I see. So with the fewer, and I'm glad that it's fewer than it needs, I hope it's fewer than it needs to be. Right. I think the governor with his sensitivity to this cause and, will have no two ways about it and will sign it. Right, upon and I would a, think with the, the with the speaker being a, a co-author, have you spoken with his Department of Justice, with his staff about this to kind of set the framework as this marches through the legislature? Actually, we have the Attorney General, Kamala Harris, who came oh. on TV to oh. show her support and put her weight behind this bill as well. Because once this became a national news, it was embarrassing yes. to many people who did not give a hood about my bill when I first time introduced it through the Assembly and then through the Senate. I want to ask you more a bit about realignment. Uh, as you know, under realignment, uh, lesser charged offenders are serving time in county uh, jails, not state prisons. There has been a lot of rumblings about the fact that smaller rural, semi-rural counties are being shortchanged and not getting the funding that they need. When I think about your home county, San Luis Obispo, it falls into that category of kind of a smaller county that may not be getting its fair share. Have you spoken with Sheriff Parkinson about this issue? Are you concerned about the funding formulas for realignment, despite Prop 30's passage, which is supposed to guarantee funding? I had a discussion with Sheriff Parkinson much earlier, as I did with our district attorney, Jerry Shea, and our sure. probation officers, just to see that we're all because I wasn't a supporter of uh, AB 109 for the reasons that would this enforce or, or impact the local decision makers by putting more criminals on our right. backyard than where they belong to. Lucky for us in San Luis Obispo County and North and Santa Barbara counties, the impact hasn't been as negative as some areas where criminals uh, record or the scores are much higher, right. such as, let's say, Fresno area, right. where every time you need an article, who, who there's been a release, a person has come out and then got back and killed a person who maybe first time around he abused her or right. him. Right, right. I mean, so there are areas where it has caused much more problem than it should have because of this but regulation. That being said, I've spoken with many of your colleagues, both Democrats and Republicans, and there are efforts marching through the legislature to reform realignment in some capacity. It's not going away. We know that. Do you feel as if, despite the fact that your area may not be as dramatically impacted as others, we need to see some realignment reform? I'm, I'm all for it. I, like, I love, would love to see it because my fear, even in our area, that we're not yet impacted by this decision, but we will be. Right. We will be for the reasons that our prisons are getting overpopulated and the federal law will come down to us and say, you're in violation the of the federal law, could be now, now release them. Where do they go? Where would, what would happen to our I neighborhoods? Understand. His name is Katro Shajian. He is a member of the California State Assembly. My name is Brad Palmer. Thank you so much for watching California Edition.